to do the job that only he could do. Amen. And the time is coming where we will thank God for his birth. You know, it's so easy to, to get caught up, though, in that hustle and the bustle and the busyness of this season, particularly on a day like today when after the service we're going to celebrate uh, with the Thanksgiving lunch. And, and I see the hustle and bustle. Everybody's bringing in a dish and people are going in there. Real easy to lose sight of the fact that we came here today not because this is a glee club. Because <laughs> we enjoy seeing each other and we want to hang out together. Those are all good things. But we came here today because you expect to have a spiritual experience with God. We came here today because you believe that when Jesus said he set up the church for the purpose of of equipping the saints. You believe him. You took that at face value and you gathered here today to hear from God directions for your life. I need to share with you something. If you don't think that's what's happening, for whatever reason, maybe you don't like the building, you don't think God can be in a building like this. Or maybe you don't like the dining area. God would have to die in a much better way. Maybe you don't think God is speaking through the pastor. Then you need to be somewhere where you believe those things are true. Because otherwise, you're wasting your time. Amen. Men won't be doing something else. Go cut the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> but if you hear this morning to hear from God, and I want you to speak. I want you to now begin to prepare your hearts. I want you to begin to settle into the Spirit of God. I want you now to have expectation that God is going to speak to you. And I remember when I was called into ministry, and I shared that with my uncle who had also been called into ministry. And I'll never forget uh, when he told me the seriousness what happens at this podium? We have fun and we like to have fellowship. But listen, we need to know that in the church, the Spirit of God reigns. And when we come in here, it's for an exchange with Him. The Bible establishes the, 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 the sacredness of this moment and, 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 and how important it is to God right from the start of the church with, with, with uh, Ananias and so, uh, so fire his wife. Amen. The Spirit of God reigns in the church. And we're not here to play house or to play church this morning. We're here to hear from God. So let us, let us, let us prepare our hearts. I'm so grateful uh, to, to look out and see all of you this morning. A couple of things I'd like to just echo. The uh, meeting right after lunch today with the executive committee will not be a long meeting, but it will be an important meeting. There's some things I'd like to share with you that you can help uh, in this effort to share the leadership of this church. Amen. So we will meet right after uh, our lunch today. I'm excited that next week, and that wasn't emphasized. Next week is the hanging of the green. I need to hear an amen. <laughs> that is a tradition of this church goes back year, decades. And the reason that it works, it, it's, it's a time where we're gonna we're gonna go into our storage room, bring out all of the Christmas decorations, and we're gonna decorate the church, we're gonna give a tree. The, the reason that that has worked for the for the past 100 years is because guess what? Different people have participated. Amen. It wasn't just me and Pastor Stan for the last 113 years. It wouldn't have worked. And if we're expecting the same people who did it last year to be the only ones doing it, it won't work. I need some new people to stay after church next week to help us decorate this tree. And it's such a fun occasion. We're going to have hot chocolate, and we're just going to have the Christmas music playing, and we're going to decorate God's house. 
and prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus. I'm excited about that. I hope you are as well. Let's make this year, as it has been every year, a festive event, the uh, hanging of the green. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, since we're all family uh, today, we didn't have any outside guests. You know, I, I can, I can, can we talk today? Yeah. Amen. Can we, can we let our hair down, so to speak, uh, and, and, and have some genuine conversation this morning? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Uh, I see that phenomenon happening, happening again. I, I never can explain it why some mornings everybody sit on this, sits on this side. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> praise the Lord uh, that the day is coming real soon. You won't be able to tell that anymore because both sides. So I was like, well, God, you know, I need to go ahead and um, give them the Thanksgiving message that you gave me. Because, you know, even though we didn't finish that last message, you know, they're going to be expected uh, to hear something about this season of thankfulness. But the Lord said, no. He said, do you think it was arbitrary that that message wasn't complete? You see, there's somebody here today that wasn't here last week. Or is there somebody here today that's in a different space than they were last week? And you see, you need the second half of this message today. I mean, if you know, God will stop the world for one. The Bible says that for the night, you'll leave the 99 to go get the one. Right. He will go get the one. But if the one leaves before he gets there, Well, he comes for the one and the one says no, then there's nothing that can be done. But I believe, God, there was somebody that God wanted to be here uh, for this message. And, and, and I believe it's going to meet you uh, in a way that um, will let you know uh, without question that it is the Spirit of the Lord speaking to you this morning. You know, say something we all know, and I think we've probably all heard before. Is that if you keep doing the same thing, you can expect that you will keep getting the same result. Keep doing the same thing, you will keep getting the same result. In fact, they say it's insane to think anything else. But the definition of insanity is to believe the opposite, that I can do the same thing but get a different result. That's the dilemma of Though we know it burned us last time, we think this time's going to be different. And over and over and over and over and over again, we keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result. Now, it seems pretty simple, but how many of you know that change is hard? Change is not easy. Especially when you've been doing something a particular way, you're used to responding in a particular way. You've been doing that all your life. It becomes especially difficult to change. But here's the truth. The Lord sent me here to, to share this with somebody. It doesn't matter who you are or what you have done. Whether you are advanced in years or whether you are young and just getting started in life. Whether you are healthy right now or whether right now you are experiencing sickness in your body. Whether you are married, whether you are single. Whether you are employed or whether you are unemployed. Whether you have a family, divorced, a widow, it doesn't matter. Nothing is too difficult for God to change in a person's life. Since we serve a God who is able to do anything, anything, and most of the time, he brings the change in a way that exceeds our expectations. Last 
last weekend, uh, last Saturday, I uh, went and got a car wash, and uh, I, had a, I had a meeting early that morning, so I needed to find a car wash that was open early, and I found one that was open at 7.30, right over here on uh, Aurora. And I pull in, I'm the first person, first customer of the day, nobody else is even there. Pull in, I give them my keys, my car goes through the car wash, comes out of the polish it up and everything, and the guy hands me back my key, I hop in my car, I drive home. I get home, park my car in the carport, get out of my car, hit the, hit the button to lock the door, and boom, the trunk pops open. So I think that's weird. I close the trunk, and, and boom, do it again to lock the door, boom, the trunk pops open. So I look at my key, and somehow it's been jammed. You can see that the key is it, it, there's something, it looks broken, there's something wrong with it. And I go, oh my God, the car wash people broke my key. Right, it had to be them because it worked fine, you know, yet the day before, and it worked fine that morning when I got in my car, hit the button, got my door, got it. It had to be the car wash. So I said, I gotta go and I can't go back right now and take my shower, get ready, because I gotta go to this meeting, I'll go right past the car wash, go and I tell him, hey man, listen, they broke my key. Now, I knew that uh, I would not get a good reception. How many of you know, you go back to the car wash and say, this didn't work, this you did this. We know, no, no, we don't know, uh, we, we can do it. I'm thinking, they're gonna tell me they can do it, but so, there's a little voice that says, well, you go anyway. Go anyway and just let them know that in their process, somehow or another, they, there's a capacity to jam people's keys. So, okay, so I get in my car and I get right next to the, I have to make a left turn into the car wash, and one more time, if I can, I'll just go. What's the use? They're not going to care. You're going to have to go buy a new key. And you know, those keys can be expensive when you have to get them from the dealer, right? You can't get them anywhere else. You got to get them from the dealer. And, you know, he starts licking his chops when you walk in right for another key. That'll be $250 or something wild, right? So I'm going to have to, so, so it kind of put a tarnish on the day. You know, it's kind of like on a beautiful day, all of a sudden, like, ah, now I've got this little nagging thing. I gotta go, first of all, I can't lock my car with the button anymore. I gotta do it manually. And the trunk is pop popping open. And, you know, it's just kind of, my spirit was a little dampened. And uh, I thought, you know, what's the use, Lord, because I'm talking to God. What's the use, God, to go in here? You know, I know these people aren't gonna own up to it. And, and like I said, the little boy says, go. So I pull in the park in the car wash and I go, hey, can I talk to a man? And the manager comes out, real nice too. I think he's an Arabian guy. He comes out, he's smiling, real nice guy. I said, hey, sir, uh, this morning I got my car washed here and somehow or another uh, your technician uh, jammed my key. And he goes, no, there's no way that could happen. Like I thought, no, there's no way that could happen. You know, we do is turn the car on and we, we hook the key on a hook and, and that's it. There's no way we could have broke your key. I said, well, sir, I don't know how to broke these, but let me show you what's happening. And I hit the button, boom, sure enough, my trunk pops over. And he says, that's strange, let me see your key. I show him my key. The dude looks at the key, does something, boom, he says, now try, boom, my key was fixed. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, I almost didn't come back. And I would have bought a new key. And the Lord said, no, go back, go back, because that was the Lord. He said, no, no, you go back. I said, what can come out of it? I have no idea what can come out of it. And, and, and it was just proof that it never fell. God was exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ever think yeah, 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 yeah. And sometimes we just have to trust him and be obedient to the Spirit. And then God does the miraculous. We know with Abraham and Sarah, Sarah was like, ha, 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 me at 99, how could I be pregnant? <laughs> and not only did she, did she get pregnant and conceived, but just as the Lord promised her descendants now, more numerous than the stars, exceedingly and abundantly above all that we could ever think. Listen, he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the immortal God. The one who resides in an unapproachable land. And today I want to talk to you about how God makes his unlimited power available to us to fight what Paul says in our text is the good fight of faith. Can we talk about that today? Yes. Right, that's right, right. Praise the God, we thank you. 
for another opportunity to come before your throne and have you speak to our hearts in a way that only you can do. Lord, how can it be that the message each morning meets our flaws in such a way that we know that it is designed by you specifically for us? So, Lord, I pray that we would all have that experience this morning and you would be glorified as a result. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Now, last week, Saints, we started this message, The Good Fight of Faith, and I talked to you about two things that are important and related to this fight that we're all called to. First of all, we saw that it's not optional. Every single believer is in a fight, in, in a fight rather, in a struggle with the Spirit of God in them and their flesh. We are all in that battle. It is not an optional fight. And, and anything that we're willing to endure, anything that we're willing to give, any effort that we're willing to make to allow God's Spirit to win that struggle is a part of what Paul refers to as the good fight of faith. That's a good battle. You're battling to do the right thing. That's a good battle for you. Because out of that battle, your faith grows. God's able to increase your faith. That's why Paul said later, uh, 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 James tells us, count it, count it all uh, uh, to the glory of God, the many trials that we go through. It's a blessing to be in this struggle because, you see, you're going to win. Because God chose you from the foundation of the world to win that struggle. And it's a good fight. It's a good fight. So we saw it's not optional. We all are in this battle. Next we saw that, listen, this is so important. It's not a fight against flesh and blood. Your battle is not with your wife. Your battle is not with, Lord, this man, he has tested me. Oh, my God. No, no, no. It's, it's whatever is in you internally that is causing you to be discontent with him. See, this is an internal battle. It's never a battle with your sister. It's never a battle with your brother. It's never a battle with people. It's that part of you that is preventing you from being patient and tolerant like the God we serve with that individual. And that's what God wants for you. It's never external. It's always internal. So it's not optional. And it's never against people. And today I want to talk to you about what I believe is without a doubt the most important thing we have to be aware of if we're going to win this good fight of the faith, and that is perseverance. We have to be willing to persevere. There are no easy, quick victories when it comes to battling in that internal struggle that we all fight to do the right thing. It's a lifelong battle. And there are no easy victories. So today I want to look at, um, before we get started, I want to look at um, what Paul means, in, in a little more detail, what Paul means by the good fight of faith. In our text, we didn't get a chance to read that this morning, Pat, why don't we do that? Uh, turn to uh, 1 Timothy, chapter 6. And your few Bibles, page is 1850 to 51, verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 11 through uh, 16. But you men, but you woman of God, but you man of God, flee uh, all this. And, and, he, and he's referring to uh, the, the, the works of the flesh that um, uh, were, were detailed for us in Galatians chapter 5. It says, flee those things and instead pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Endurance in some translations is perseverance. What do what, what, what those attributes remind you of? The fruit of the Spirit. And then Paul is saying here, pursue the fruit of the Spirit, 
Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed, the only ruler, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, and who lives in an unapproachable life, who no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. God admonishes us in this text to fight the good fight, knowing that we were chosen, we were called before the foundation of the Lord to struggle, to, to, to fight in this battle against our flesh flesh and the spirit are contrary to one another. So that the Bible says we're not able to do those things we know are right and we want to do. And it is that battle, that internal battle that Paul is referring to as the good fight of faith. So the good fight of faith then can simply be understood as that struggle that takes place in our minds to do the right thing in a particular area of our lives. It's not, it doesn't suffice to say to do the right thing in general. It's the struggle that we go through internally, mentally, to do what we know is right in a specific area of our lives. Listen, other areas, you have no problem doing the right thing. It may be an area where somebody else struggles, but for you, no problem to do the right thing in this particular area, in, in other areas. Right? But in this particular area, and I really know God has brought that area to each and, one, each and every one of you sitting here. I don't have to know yours. You don't have to know mine. But we all have areas in our lives where we struggle to do what we know is right. The good fight is, 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 is that fact that we enter into to do the right thing. Now, other areas we have no problem, but in this particular area you struggle, maybe it's your temper. You don't want to fly off the handle as quick as you do, but it, but it happens. And God wants to teach you humility. That's the right thing to do, and you struggle with that because, you know, after all, you know, this person blew it. Now, I need to let them know I'm not a doormat. Our temper, just we fly off the handle. And maybe that's the area where you struggle. Maybe maybe it's, it's being true to your spouse. Maybe there's, you struggle with infidelity. It happens, saints. There are folks who struggle with that. And they want to do the right thing, but they battle in that area. Or maybe it's lying. And, 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 you know, lying is one of those things that snowballs. Once you tell one lie, you got to tell another lie. Remember that lie? And you, just before you know it, you know, you're living in this false setting that you've created through lying. Maybe it's lying. Maybe it's jealousy. You know, or, or, or envy. You have a hard time accepting that God is good not just to you, but to everybody. And you're jealous. Maybe it's jealousy. Young folks call that hating. Maybe, maybe you have a problem with being a hater. I mean, you know, that's a real thing. Sometimes you could have folks in your life that you, you think they're your friends, but really they're just waiting around for that opportunity to say, yeah, I knew you weren't all that you said you, you thought you were. Waiting to kick you. When you fall, some people struggle with that. Maybe it's jealousy or envy. Or, or maybe it's rage. Before you know it, you're in a rage. You know, rage has to do with that matter. Before you know it, you're in a rage, you've said something, you can't take back down, you've hurt someone. By your rage, rage has been the cause of many separate relationships. And you need to get a handle and you struggle with that. Or maybe it's stealing or gossip, or maybe it's, it's addiction. 
But in this particular area, you struggle. And you know, saints, the measure of your spiritual growth, the measure of your spiritual maturity is the extent to which you allow God's Spirit to give you victory in that area of your life. Not whether you got the job. Not, not whether uh, uh, you, you, you got the apartment or the car. The measure of your spiritual growth, the measure of faith, God's faith working in you is the extent to which you are willing to allow the Spirit of God to change you in that area where you struggle. Because some folks have given up. Oh, it's just the way I am. Never going to be able to stop that. Never going to be able to change that. And they have become spiritually stagnant. They keep wanting God to help them deal with this, but God said, no, 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 you're over here. You see, the the, the, the beautiful thing about the power of God is it is unlimited. But God's power is never going to meet you over here where you want to be. His power is going to meet you over here where you are. It's like being healed after stepping on a nail that passes through your shoe and into your foot. Go to God with this nail in your shoe and this sore on your foot, and you lay your foot before God, and you say, God, heal my foot. God, in his wisdom, is not going to heal that sore while the nail is still in your shoe. Guess what God will do? He'll say, son, daughter, take the nail out of the shoe, and then your foot's going to automatically heal. Sometimes that's the way we go to God. We go to God thinking we know the problem. This is what I need you to deal with, God. God says, no, the problem is here. It's your attitude. It's, it's, it's you. It's not this. It's you. And God wants us to know that the measure of our spiritual maturity, what life is all about in Christ, you growing in your understanding of the Lord, and your faith growing from us, from from a mustard seed to where, where God's going to take it. He gives each of us a measure of faith that he expects a return on. Your life is about that return. And the measure of your success as a spiritual being is the extent to which you are willing to allow God's spirit to give you victory in that area that you're struggling with. In that area that you're struggling with. I don't know what it is. Your neighbor doesn't know what it is. You know, sometimes we sit there like we got it all together, and there's a major uh, uh, internal problem, war going on inside of us. God wants you to know this morning that that's the good fight. That's the good fight. And that's the fight you were chosen to fight. That is the battle that he says, uh, before the foundations of the world he laid on us. It's a daily battle. It's a battle which Jesus says, therefore take up your cross daily. Take up your cross daily and follow me. You know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's not a one-time thing. And so then real quick, the battle is not optional, it's not against people. And to be victorious, you must be willing to persevere. Let's talk about perseverance now. James, Pastor James, gives us a really good piece of information that helps us with, with perseverance. You know, uh, in, in, implicit in persevering is that you will eventually get to the end of whatever this thing is that you're struggling with that's difficult. Persevere to the end, right? Jesus says that. And, and, and James, Pastor James gives us this beautiful verse uh, over in, in, in James chapter 4, verse 7. He says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Yeah. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. To resist the devil means to persevere under his assault, and don't give in to his temptation. 
To resist the devil means to, to, to know that this is only for a, a spell, a period of time. I just need to hang on. You know, sometimes when we're under the pressure to do what we know is not right in this particular area where we struggle, sometimes that pressure can be unbearable. God, I ever have not fallen to this. The pressure sometimes seems unbearable. But listen, the Bible tells us that God will never put more on us. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God will never allow us to be tempted beyond that which we can be. It says when we are tempted, he will provide a way for us to stand. No one has the excuse to give in to the temptation. Oh, God, that was too much. And the curious thing about temptation, to do the wrong thing in that area that God has brought to your heart, that you, the, 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 the interesting thing about temptation in that particular area is that the more we resist and allow God to get us to that place where it's like, oh, the pressure to do this has passed. The more we are allowing God to give us to that space, the less and less pressure we feel under the gun of that temptation. And the enemy always comes to us. You know that, listen, you may be able to get past this now, but what about next week at the barbecue? Or, or what about a month from now when all the family comes over? Or what about when this situation comes? You know you're going to fail then, so you may as well give in now. Well, God reminds us in his, in, in, in his word that he will never put more on us than we can bear. And he will always provide a way out for you to stand. He will always provide a way out. You know, Paul in Romans tells us there's a law at work when it comes to this struggle that there is to do the right thing in that particular area. He says, there's a law you need to be a cop, you need to be aware of, you need to be cognizant of. And this is the law. He says, when you want to do good, know that evil is right there with you. When you want to do good, know that evil is right there with you. And, 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 and what's being said is that is know that this is a spiritual battle that you are in. That there are forces of evil who want you to continue to fail in this particular area of their life. They don't want you to have victory. It's a spiritual battle. Whenever I'm faced with temptation to act out in that particular area where God has shown me, uh, I praise the Lord saints, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop for one second. I gotta ask uh, Manny and everybody, the activity you guys have to stop. I really don't want food out there until we at the end of the service. Praise the Lord. Where was it? Yeah, there's a law. There's a law that when we want to do good, evil is present. Can we also have a quiet now a little bit? Praise the Lord. Says I don't know, but the Lord's put on my spirit. You know we. Say, we are not playing church here. This is somebody's life, somebody's gonna make a decision today that's gonna have eternal ramifications in their life. We were talking about a battle for your soul. That's the good fight. That's the good fight. Because listen, it's not optional for the believer to have victory. Not optional. If you believe Jesus is the Son of God, then the Bible says God remains in you and you are in him. And greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And what that means is by definition, believers are not quitters. Believers are not quitters. Well, yeah, you need to give the Lord a hand for it. Believers are not quitters. Show fruit. The Bible says every tree that comes before the Lord, judgment day, he's going to be a tree shaker. 
He's going to shake every tree, and that's you. You and I were trees. He's going to shake every tree, and fruit has to fall. Fruit has to fall. Love, joy, peace. The things that we're robbed of every time we make that decision to do the wrong thing in this particular area. He's going to shake our tree. And any tree that doesn't drop fruit, he says it's huge down. And then Paul goes, I'm going to say, that's not you, though. You've been called to much better things because you're sitting here under the auspices of the Holy Spirit having, making a connection with God this morning to receive the instruction that the Holy Spirit wants to lead you in that leads to eternal length. So the enemy doesn't want us to win. There's this battle. But you know, our maturity is gauged by the extent to which we're willing to allow God to work in that area. And I need to tell you, sometimes we fall. The Bible says, you know, Jesus says, I'm praying for you. Jesus says, or, uh, Jesus says he's praying for Peter. Peter, you know, get, the devil wants to sift you like wheat. He says, but I'm praying for you that your faith will not fail. And Peter denied Jesus three times. The prayer wasn't that he would not fall. The prayer was that he would get back up. And somebody here this morning needs to know you can get back up. You can get back up. God is praying for you in this particular area. Not in general. You know this area of struggle. For you. Listen, the devil doesn't want you to stop smoking. He doesn't want you to control your temper. He doesn't want you to learn humility. He wants you to fly off the handle and, and, and continue to lose position and, and lose everything that you've been working for spiritually time after time after time after time after time, after time again. How I many of you know you can't be double-minded? Double-minded man or woman can't expect anything from God. What that means is you can't expect to eat from the table of the enemy and the table of God and think that's okay. You have to repent when you eat from the table of the enemy. And you have to be determined to only sit at the table of God. You can't come to a place where you say, okay, but eat from both. And somebody's in that struggle this morning. And you need to know God has given you the power to resist the devil. To know that he will flee. This pressure is not unending. You're going to get to a point where the pressure is relieved. Right now, you, you can't think about anything else. But listen, the day will come where that won't be a problem anymore. But you've got to trust God and be willing to persevere. Perseverance means that you keep resisting no matter how difficult it may be. Knowing that a point will come and God guarantees this point will come. When the pressure of that temptation will subside. It's a promise from God. You'll never allow you to get to a point where the temptation is just too much. The, 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 I'm a living witness. I know there are others. You know, today, when I wake up in the morning, I don't, have, I don't feel the pressure to take the money I got and go buy a rock. Some of you don't know what rocks are. That's okay. <laughs> But there was a time in my life where that was a genuine pressure for me every day. Oh, gee, I don't want to do it. Today, I don't have that pressure. Today, it's gone. The enemy has fled. He comes back for something else. So, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. Having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. You will receive the crown of life. Last thing I want to talk about is there's no, there aren't any quick victories. This, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. You may have temporary success or, 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 or momentary victory, but if you're going to make it to the end, if this change is going to be perfect, you must be willing to persevere through time uh, and, 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 and allow God to, to work this process in you. Paul said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Many start out in the race, 
but they don't finish. Many people start out, the Bible says many are called, but a few are chosen. Jesus says many people are on that broad highway where anything goes. You know, if I want to do this, I can do it. I don't know. Jesus paid the penalty. I don't, know. I don't do whatever I want to do. Many people on that broad highway, but it says very few people find that narrow path, that straight path that leads to righteousness. The path that says, I recognize, Lord, the difference between the flesh and the spirit. And I recognize that battle raging on the inside of me, but I want to do what is right. I have a desire. So, oh God, these from us is our willingness to say, God, you are right, and everything else is wrong. I may not live it perfectly, but that is, it is my desire to pursue it with every ounce of my being. And so, when we're able to make that confession, we recognize the importance of pursuing the things of God. Now, the opposite of perseverance is quitting or giving up. For the believer, this is not an option. Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And we should all be following his example. The only question for the believer is how high do you want to go? How high do you want to go? Paul says, I press toward the high call. And the question for us is how high do you want to go? Do you want to continue doing what you've been doing? Do you want to keep getting what you've been getting? If you want to go higher, then today is the day to draw a line in the sand and take a stand be willing to fight the battle of faith. If you want to come up higher, take a stand. Accept that the battle is eternal. It's not with other people. It is a battle that rages on the inside of me. But it's a battle that I've been equipped by Jesus to win. We all have a God-given measure of faith to overcome our personal troubles. Can I tell you that again? God gave you what you need to overcome in this particular area where you are struggling. The Bible says that some people will get a 30% return, some people will get a 60% return, and some people will get a 100% return on that measure of faith that God has given all of us. Really, the choice is yours. You know, sometimes we have to say when faced with temptation to do the wrong thing, we have to say, you know what, I've done that. I've been down that road. I've had those experiences. God, take me higher. I don't want to lose what I've always lost. I don't want to go down that path I've always done. God, take me higher. Take me to something else. I don't want my temper to make me lose it all. I don't want my addiction to cause me one more time to lose it all. God, help me. And it's funny when we get to that point and we say, God, we cry out, help me. How the Spirit of God comes into our hearts and does something exceedingly abundantly above what we could have expected. He is such a good God. He is such a good God. And so we recognize then that he tests us as I close. The Bible tells us that God will always test you in that area of your life where you struggle in order to show you the condition, the status of your faith. Because see, it's easy for us, it's easy for us to have false uh, 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 understandings about where we are spiritually. You know, sometimes folks come into the church and we have the same confession that, that people have in the world. People in the world say, I used to be the janitor, now I'm the CEO. Look how much I've grown. And they use a carnal standard to measure their progress. How I many of you know we don't use a carnal measure? Listen, listen, you can have profit everything the world has to offer and lose your very soul. We don't measure where we are from God by that, by that carnal standard. And so we recognize then that. Uh, that, that, that God has given us a measure of faith that he's going to test us in those areas where we struggle for the purpose of showing us the condition of our faith. And you need to know
know that nothing gives you a better gauge of where you are in your faith than those areas in which you struggle. Because we don't want to look at that. We don't want to look over here. We don't want to look at our weaknesses. But guess what? It is in your weakness that God's power is perfected. Amen. And if you want to experience the power of God, have the courage to face your weaknesses. Have the courage to say, God, I need you right here. I struggle with this here. And be willing to allow the Spirit of God to take you higher and begin to experience the power of God, which is real. It's not something we have to make up. It's not something that we do through positive thinking. When you cry out to God in that area, you say, help me, Jesus. I don't want to do it no more. I want to live for you. It is amazing what God's power then does when it enters us to give us victory in that area. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus comes that we might have life and have that life more abundant. Will you do the right thing now? Will you, will, 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 will you, will you turn to God or will you succumb to the temptation one more time? Now is the time to draw the battle line and to be willing to fight the good fight. We don't know how long we have on the face of this planet. Nobody knows how long we get to allow the Spirit of God to give us victory in that particular area of your life. But I want to admonish you today that you draw the line now. That you make today the day when I will no longer make excuses for falling in that area. God, today I choose to overcome in that particular area of my life because I know you've given me what I need to overcome. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. When you made your confession in the presence of many witnesses, don't give up. For those who are willing to persevere to the end, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me. To give to everyone according to their work. Amen. 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 Amen.